Hello, I'm Paddy Delaney, and welcome to Integrated Infrastructure, a podcast dedicated to bringing you news and views from industry leaders involved in the development, design, construction, and management of the many built forms that make up Australia's integrated infrastructure. This is episode 11 of Integrated Infrastructure, and in this episode, I'm talking to Jason Pugh, General Manager at the East Rockingham Waste to Energy Plant in Western Australia. East Rockingham is the second commercial waste to energy plant being built in Australia at the moment, and it's a springboard for what is and what will be an exciting and growing industry. In this episode, we talk about Jason's 10-year labour of love to get this project off the drawing board and into reality. We talk about the financial, technical and community challenges that need to be balanced to make a project like this a success. And we talk about the jobs generated, the waste taken away from landfill, the 64,000 cars taken off the road in terms of net carbon generated and much more. I hope you enjoy this edition of the podcast. Please like, share, comment and subscribe if you do. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Jason. Welcome to Integrated Infrastructure. Fantastic to uh, to have you on today. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure. Look, um, as you know, we're a short form podcast. So as always, we'll ju- dive straight into it. Um, it'd be fantastic if you could kick off by just giving us an idea about who you are, who you work for, what, what you do. Okay, so thanks. So uh, I'm Jason Pugh. I'm the General Manager of East Rockingham Waste to Energy. Um, so I work for John Lang, uh, the UK-based infrastructure investor. Um, really fantastic company, been around for about 170 years. Uh, in the Asia-Pacific region, uh, we've been here since 2011. Um, we've currently got about um, 1.7 billion pounds of assets um, under our management um, and uh, you know, really a trusted pair of hands in the infrastructure world um, with, with a bunch of really interesting assets uh, across the country. Uh, here in Perth, the most uh, noted one is is Optus Stadium uh, as part of the West Stadium uh, Consortium um, and uh, have to be WA's most beloved asset. So, yeah, really proud and, and happy to be a part of the John Lang team. Yeah. And, and good to see Rugby Union being played uh, in WA again, going back to our, our little chat a moment ago. <laughs> um, still, a, still a bit of a sore topic with the Western Force, but anyway... Well, hopefully that's all going to change, and we're going to have a great tournament sort of going forward. But um, but, but but back to the the matter at hand. Um, you mentioned the East Rocking and Waste to Energy plant there, um, and and it's it's it, it's not just something to really you know pass in mention in passing, is it? That's it's actually been quite a long journey for you, and something that you've been working on for quite a long time. Yeah, look, it really has. So in 2010, I was lucky enough to get the opportunity to work uh, with a new company by the name of New Energy Corporation. New Energy really were the pioneers in this in this space in Australia. Um, the directors and shareholders had the vision um, to establish large-scale waste energy here in Western Australia with a project in Port Hedland and another one uh, in, in Perth. Um, I have to say, you know, we, we had uh, great enthusiasm, but probably not a great vision on how we were going to get to this end point and it ended up being a, a very long and, and expensive journey but uh, one that was re- always really really interesting and, and um, how, how did the opportunity arrive for you in terms of working for, for um, the new energy company and t- tell us a bit about that journey of the t- you know 10-year journey to get to the, the where you are to, with the project now sure so I uh, I was working for a gentleman by the name of Doug Miller uh, in a listed uh, water treatment company and we'd been in business for, for some time and uh, in 2010 uh, he got together with uh, the other directors of New Energy, uh, in particular Enzo Galotti and the Mangione brothers and Neil Martin um, and um, uh, headhunted me, if you will, to come over and, and uh, head it up. So, yeah, the, the 10-year journey. So, um, you know, initially, you know, we, we really were focused on gasification technologies into the Australian market. We thought that sort of smaller decentralised model was one that was, was really fit for purpose uh, for Australia. Um, uh, so we went and found two sites. As I said, um, at Port Hedland was the first large-scale waste to energy project approved in Australia uh, in 2012. Uh, and then we had a, a approval for a gasification plant in, in Perth in 2013. And as sort of 2013, 2014 wore on, we, we, we participated in some local government tenders um, and it became uh, obvious to us that unfortunately the, um, the, the councils wanted the more 
mature technologies, um, the, the moving mm-hmm. rate incineration type technologies. So we were unsuccessful uh, in, in a tender and, and we really had to be nimble and think, well, okay, um, if we're going to uh, maximise this opportunity, we really need to team up with an experienced technology provider. Um, so in about 2017, uh, we, we formed a partnership with um, Itachi, Zozine and Nova, um, uh, really one of the world's leading technology providers in this space um, with over 500 reference plants. And, and also importantly for us was, you know, their reference plants are on the Thames right in the middle of London mm. and, and right next to the Eiffel Tower in Paris. So um, very, very experienced contractor. Um, we uh, had to redo our environmental permit, uh, which again was a, you know, a big decision for the company to make. Um, and we worked with uh, HZI and um, another group called Tribe Infrastructure Developments Mm-hmm. Um, to to really recut the East Rockingham Waste to Energy Plant. So we sort of had to start from ground one again, start our community consultation all over again. Um, as I said, we uh, tended and were successful uh, in the East Metropolitan Regional Council tender process. So that underpinned the project with some with some waste. Um, subsequently, won the City of Rockingham, mm-hmm. uh, sorry, the City of Coburn, um, and uh, went through the community process. So. Um, you know, uh, it, that was a really long journey uh, with lots of ups and downs um, and it and, and took a very, very committed uh, board of, of, and shareholders at New Energy Corporation to go that distance. And then, you know, you get to the, uh, the 80-20 rule, you get to that last 20%, which is the, the bankability of these projects. Um, and it's just a, another level again uh, of, of complexity. You know, these are very, very complex infrastructure projects with, with many, many stakeholders. So I think at financial close, I think we had six or seven international law firms working on the project and, um, you know, as many consultants as you could, you could count. And uh, it was really an intense process um, that culminated in us uh, reaching financial close on the 23rd of December uh, last year. Yeah, it's fantastic. And you've, you've won some awards for, those deal, for the deal-making process that you've been through as well, haven't you? We have. We, we won the... Uh, uh, renewable Energy Asset of the Year and the Waste Asset of the Year uh, as well uh, from two separate publications. Um, and it really does acknowledge um, the, the level of complexity around these deals. You know, these are very difficult to bank. Um, we, you know, we had some fantastic people um, in the consortium, uh, which is still that human resource is still the most important part of the whole puzzle. Uh, we received some great support from the federal government as well uh, through the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and also through ARENA. Uh, ARENA was uh, um, provided us uh, some grant funding uh, and the CEFC provided some really unique uh, debt structures that really enabled the project to, to, to get off the runway. So you know, we'll be eternally grateful for them, that's for sure. That's brilliant. And, and um, what's the difference then between the gasification that you were originally looking at and the, um, in, I'm using my turn, the sort of in, um, thermal incineration um, process that you, you're using now? Yeah, so look, they're both thermal processes, but what gasification does is it has an interim step before you get to full combustion, where essentially it extracts all the carbon from the waste into a, a, a rich gas, um, essentially methane and, and carbon dioxide, sorry, carbon monoxide, um, and then you fire that gas in a separate process mm. um, to recover the energy, um, whereas incineration uh, essentially uh, combusts the waste right through to carbon dioxide in, in one process. Um, so, as I said, you know, the, the, the moving grade incinerator is certainly a more proven technology. I still think gasification is, is a very appropriate technology for smaller decentralised plants, and I, I do think we're going to see some of those uh, in the Australian landscape in the next 10 years. Yeah, fantastic. And was that um, about as much about the sort of community um, 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 feeling around one type of project rather than another as, as has been the case with other projects? Yeah, it was a real learning curve for us. Uh, you know, we we certainly went with gasification because our primary stakeholder um, that we recognised was the community to get them on board with what we were doing. And, and that turned out to be the case. Absolutely, the community is the number one stakeholder. Mm-hmm. But there's this big ugly thing in the background called bankability. And, you know, you need to ensure that uh, all the boxes are ticked with, it, with these projects, including um, technology providers that have a long track record that can provide the performance guarantees and bonding that's required to bank a project. Um, and in the end for us, um, uh, we reverted to one of the world's biggest suppliers uh, to ensure the bankability of the project and uh, that mm. turned out to be a good decision. That's great. 
uh, t- 10 years in anybody's career is a, a hefty amount of time. It could be probably, you know, up to 25%, um, some, 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 somewhere in that sort of region of somebody's career. Um, how do you stick it out for 10 years um, to, to get to the point that you, where, where you're at? What, 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 um, what sort of mental fortitude do you have to deploy to, to hang in there? Well, look, I think the first thing to say is that it was always a, a very, very interesting role and there was always new challenges coming up and, and that sort of environment is continually challenges you to, uh, you know, find the best in yourself. Um, it's certainly, uh, you know, you have some days where, you, you know, you have difficulty picking yourself up. Uh, again, you know, um, uh, the real heavy lifting was done, you know, I think by the directors and shareholders of New Energy Corporation really uh, by going the full distance and continually mm. funding this uh, this corporation that was just taking, taking, taking. So, uh, you know, it certainly takes uh, it takes a lot there. Um, and uh, look, uh, I think um, it's very, really important in a role like that to um, be able to compartmentalise uh, the job as well. You know, I've got a very loving and supporting family that I'm able to focus on outside of work and uh, just sort of uh, bring you back down to ground zero. And, and that certainly was really important. Um, certainly a lot of pressure um, through to financial close you know, that, uh, that money is at risk right until the final signature on that document. So mm. you certainly have to hold your nerve um, in, a, in a role like that. Um, and, you know, we certainly had some fantastic people, as I said before, that were supporting that structure. Um, so, so, yeah, ups and downs, but, you know, very, very relieved to hit financial close and now really energised to get on and, and build the asset. Yeah, fantastic. Congratulations. Um, and and um, talking about building the asset, where, where are we up to today? So uh, the contractor for the project is a, is a joint venture between Asiona, from, which is a large Spanish EPC, and, and HZI, the technology provider. Um, mm. We gave them notice to proceed in January of this year. Um, and so far, you know, the, the program has been um, progressing really well. Um, it's a greenfield site uh, down in East Rockingham. It's a, it's a large site. It's a 10-hectare site. So step number one was clearing the site and uh, getting all the site levels right. Um, and uh, we're through that stage. Um, all the uh, the ponds have been dug. Uh, we're now into the, the first stage of uh, real heavy piling uh, for the bunker and also for the, the boiler and air quality control system. So, yeah, at, at the moment there's um, uh, uh, Australia's largest uh, piling rig on site from uh, Geotech and uh, another ASEAN company um, putting in... Um, uh, many, many piles uh, around uh, the, as I said, the bunker area is the focus right now. Um, so we're currently pouring concrete, uh, which is, again, it's a great milestone for us and, and deep watering um, will begin in the next couple of weeks around the bunker area. Uh, in the background, there's a lot of engineering and procurement that's been taking place. Um, I think Hayes said I has completed about 90% of their engineering and placed most of their orders. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, look, we're thrilled with the way that the contractor uh, is, is working. Um, also from the John Lane team, which has been a great learning for me, we're not just an infrastructure investor, but uh, we also put teams into the, uh, the SPB of these assets mm-hmm. to make sure that they are successfully delivered, which, which for me is uh, really uh, quite a unique offering. Um, and I'm really lucky that uh, two of the guys I'm working with have come from the Optus Stadium project. <clears throat> so really experienced, um, you know, that, that asset was bought in on time and on budget. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, as I said, it's a very exciting time to see all the activity. That's brilliant. And, and when do you expect to be operational? Excuse me. So um, it's a 35-month build program, start, as I said, starting in January. So full operation will be at the end of November in 2022. Um, it's quite an interesting asset in that uh, the hot commissioning um, from first fire takes about five months through to uh, plant handover. And really during that time, you're operating the plant at almost full capacity. So really um, in about June of 2022 uh, will be our first fire. Um, And as I said, we'll be operating almost at full capacity for that first five months as the contractor Mm -hmm. completes his commissioning tests um, and then um, moving into the operations phase from there. Yeah, fantastic. And you mentioned that you've um, secured um, quite a large um, contract from the uh, Coburn Council, is that right? So our two foundation customers are the uh, East Metropolitan Regional Council, mm. uh, which is a, a six local Perth councils, uh, four of which are participating in the project. Um, mm. We also have uh, the City of Coburn. 
Um, and on top of that, we have uh, Suez uh, as the operator of the project, but also supplying waste on a ten-year deal, um, mm. which is which is great support. You know, Suez uh, certainly one of the two dominant players in the Perth market in the in the C and I space, and also mm. with local council. So you know, we're doing a lot of work with them um, to uh, structure this thing up to make sure that it meets the the, the needs of the, the clientele here in Western Australia. Uh, and we just think Suez is going to be a wonderful partner. Um, they operate 55 waste to energy plants around the world, so they also bring a wealth of experience into the operations. Fantastic. And, um, and, and so why is the plant so important for um, the East Rockingham area? Yeah, well, first thing to say is that um, uh, landfilling has been an issue here in Perth now for many years. The, the, historically, the, the, the landfills were developed on the Swan Coastal Plain, um, and as the population has grown, uh, we, we now almost fully rely on drinking groundwater uh, in addition to reverse osmosis water. So we need to get those landfills off the Swan Coastal Plain um, so that the groundwater was protected. Um, so it's really important that um, we come up with a viable option uh, and, and waste to energy is certainly that. I mean, it's, <clears throat> it just has so many advantages over landfilling. Um, there's there's the, the climate change benefits. You know, this project will have the impact of taking 64,000 cars off the road from a, from a net carbon emission savings. And, you know, that's, that's just a, a really wonderful outcome. Um, and uh, look, the other, you know, important part about this is just the level of investment and the level of opportunity for employment, et cetera, that these projects bring. Mm. Um, and there's two broad projects here in Perth with a combined value of about $1.5 billion. That's easily the biggest uh, infrastructure, uh, waste infrastructure spend, spend in Australia's history. Um, uh, you know, our project will employ uh, 50 people full time for the at least 30 years uh, operations. Um, and then if we looked at that against a, a landfill that might employ, you know, sort of three to, to sort of five guys, um, it's just a, another level altogether. Um, mm. And also the sort of skill sets um, and tasks that the project will have. Um, it's going to springboard just so many opportunities for for local local businesses and also local employees. And with COVID, it's been really interesting. You know, one of the things that's forced the project to do is to um, procure as much equipment as we can uh, here in Perth. So we're currently seeing a local local suppliers in and around the project really benefiting. Yeah, fantastic. Now, you, you touched on something there um, uh, around, you know, your project and the jobs that it's going to provide. Um, you're the second project in the area, um, um, so that's two projects. I mean, there are many others in development, some closer to closer to um, to happening than others around Australia, um, and that's happening at a time when um, our interstate borders are closed, so it's very hard to move skills around, and our international borders. Are definitely closed and could be closed for quite some time. Mm-hmm. And as you pointed out, the technology that you're working with and the plants that you're working with, it's um, it's technology that's currently deployed primarily in, or, or you know, in, in, in Europe, but also North America and, and Asia. Um, and we haven't got those skills in Australia, have we? In terms of that, that um, not necessarily the, the, the pure engineering skills and the potential to do it, but but just that deep knowledge of of how these plants work and how to how to maximise their operations. Yeah, I think certainly from a, a plant manager perspective, um, that's some skills that we're going to have to rely on uh, individuals with experience overseas. Mm. Um, our technology provider, HCI, uh, has a really well-developed training program uh, for operators. Um, it's almost like a flight simulation setup. Mm-hmm. So we're really lucky that that's something that we can roll out remotely uh, and something that, that we're focusing on, on right now. And then, you know, if we look at some of the other uh, skills that are required, um, you know, well, through the construction phase, you know, <laughs> you know it's almost 500 people uh, will be deployed on the project uh, through the construction period. So we're in the civils part at the moment. So there's a bunch of uh, civil engineering uh, being undertaken. There's a big mechanical and electrical component of these projects. Um, and then, you know, as we move into, into the operations side, yes, we have the plant manager, but then we, you know, some of the skill sets here in Western Australia will be quite transferable um, for, for individuals that, that work in the mines, um, mm. you know, and also some other industries here. I mean, I'm, I'm quite a big fan of the... Uh, uh, the submarine industry, which is local to the project here, because you know you've got uh, personnel coming out of there uh, with qualifications in boiler making, you know, electricians, mechanics, mm. uh, refrigeration mechanics, all these different sub skills. 
and they're also uh, used to you know relying on small teams to to get big jobs done. And it's the same for the uh, individuals uh, in the mining sector. These remote mine workers are just so good at planning and executing tasks uh, and uh, being flexible enough to ensure that um, you know they're not relying too heavily on on people coming from overseas to get things done. So look, we've got a big task in front of us to ensure that the project is staffed and uh, and ready to go. Um, mm. But uh, you know, we think that WA is a really good place for it. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's true. Actually, you, you've probably got a, 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 a greater depth of, um, of skills to, to tap on the West Coast than, than we have on the East Coast, I'd say. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about you know, what you just said there in terms of the, um, the industries that you can quite easily transfer people from um, in, in, into waste to energy. Um, what, um, um, you know, what, what part um, do you think waste to energy has to play in Australia's energy future? Well, you know... Waste to energy is a, is a transition or a transitional technology in that mm. you know, it's not a panacea for waste treatment, but it's a technology to get us from where we are now, which is highly dependent on landfills, to somewhere in 50 years' time where hopefully we've reduced the amount of waste that we produce and, and have a, a better solution for it. Mm. So, you know, I, I characterise waste to energy as the, the, the world's best, best method of treating residual waste streams, and it really is. So... You know, Australia is under a lot of pressure uh, right now um, in terms of uh, greenhouse gases from from landfilling. Uh, the recycling industry is under massive pressure at the moment, particularly now that we're banning the export of recyclates. You know, it's a whole industry that has to be developed. So it's really important that that waste to energy comes in and and fills that void of looking after you know residual waste streams um, whilst we you know transition to something in, into the future. No, we, we read a lot about uh, plastic pollution and, and certainly a lot of the responsibility uh, for that relies with the people who make packages, et cetera. But, you know, plastic will will keep coming into the environment and, and it's really important that we start having a sink for these waste streams. Mm. Obviously, we need to recover and recycle as much as possible, but we just can't keep landfilling waste plastics. You know, it's one of the major ways that, uh, you know, plastics... Uh, biodegrade and, and end up in the world's oceans and, and polluting the environment. So, you know, waste to energy has a role in recycling to keep that stream uh, clean uh, because, and, th- and that's the real learning from uh, the China soil crisis, which is the um, the, the banning of recyclates to, mm. to China. We became lazy and essentially we're just exporting mixed waste uh, to, to these locations. And they said, well, you know, we don't want your waste anymore. So it's really important that we that we focus on the, the value in that supply chain by creating clean recyclates and looking for reuse options locally. Um, and uh, I know it's a it's a big focus of the industry right now, and we are going to get there. But it's really important while we're doing all that stuff that we're not just putting waste into landfill and making that problem worse. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, waste to energy has a has a key role to play. Um, and then there's the energy side. You know, uh, here in Western Australia, uh, the uptake of renewable energy has been huge. Um, solar power has now taken over coal and gas as, as the largest uh, generation source on the network, which is amazing. Mm. But um, the downside of that is it, it puts a lot of pressure on a network that's that's already under a lot of pressure, the intermittent mm. nature of it. And one really interesting facet of, of waste to energy is it's a baseload renewable energy power station. So, you know, that's a really welcome uh, facet from, from a network operator perspective. Um, as, as, as we start looking to um, retire more coal assets. Um, so, yeah, that's another really important uh, part of these projects. So it could c- complement a, um, an overall energy system where you've got renew- where you've got so- solar and wind power, batteries, and, and, and then something like waste to energy where you can, you can continue, have a continual drive of, um, of power coming through. Absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. And, and what are the biggest threats to the industry taking off? Because there's um, there's a, a lot of work going on, a hell of a lot of activity across Australia. There's yourselves and um, Avertas who have got off the ground so far. Um, what are the threats to to um, to the industry as a as a whole? Well, certainly um, these are really complex infrastructure projects. So you mm. need a whole lot of stars to align to to get to a bankable place on these projects. So I think the probably biggest barrier right now is probably the the variation in government policy across Australia. Um, You know, I think the EPA in in WA, particularly Dr Paul Vogel, took a really responsible and smart approach to the industry in in that he said, look, this stuff works in Europe. 
um, we're really confident about that. So let's let's get a really you know great uh, set of consultants and go and look at how they've managed to do that and take all the best bits and then put that into a strategy for Western Australia. Mm-hmm. So basically, the output of that was that uh, best practice waste to energy, uh, which has a bunch of definitions. Uh, has acceptable impacts to the community and the environment, which is a really powerful position. Mm. Other states have struggled with that. Um, certainly, New South Wales has a you know uh, a very prescriptive policy that makes it difficult for uh, for, for projects to get up. Uh, Victoria and Queensland um, have uh, new policies that um, are far more conducive. Um, I, can't, I certainly like the the uh, path that uh, Victoria is taking. Uh, Melbourne Metro is uh, amalgamating waste from I think it's 16 councils to, um, and also finding sites for proponents to enable the industry, which is really important. You know that um, uh, those those long term waste contracts with councils are an incredibly difficult part uh, of these projects. Um, just getting that critical mass of waste and, and getting that commitment. Um, so I think Melbourne Metro is very much on the right on the right path there. Um, and we just can't can't afford to um, turn a, a blind eye to the community uh, in this uh, conversation mm. as well. Um, there's a lot of debate about you know waste to energy. You know, is it good? Is it bad? Uh, and waste to energy as an industry, we've got a lot of positive things to say about what we do. Um, you know, I wouldn't be involved in this if I didn't think it was a, a positive project for for. I'm a very proud Western Australian, so you know, I, I don't want to do anything to hurt the, the environment. Or the community, um, mm. and, and I'm really confident that that this project will bring really uh, positive benefits. But you know, we've seen waste to energy recently be banned in in the ACT, um, and, and that's a state government that produces, you know, or a state that produces 300,000 tonnes of waste and thinks it's better to, um, you know, transport that waste over the border and stick it into a landfill rather than uh, you know take on waste to energy, which mm. just beggars belief. You know, particularly with the the you know devastating bushfires in that part of the world this year, you know, what is it going to take to realise that um, uh, this has a massive impact on on climate change uh, and the benefits are are absolutely there? Mm. Um, You know, where these projects are cited, I think, is very, very important as well. Uh, Western Australia took the attitude that they should be located in heavy industrial areas. Now, around the world, that's not the case. We see them in in highly populated areas. We see them in in the middle of, of large cities. However, you know, this is Australia. We have to do it our own way. And uh, we, we felt that that was a, um, you know, a good approach. You know, the downside of that is we have two projects that are located very close to each other. Um, however, you know, the, the air modelling and the environmental impact of, of the projects has shown that it just won't impact local communities. And, and that's a really, really important facet. So mm. uh, it's, uh, it's the where is going to be important for the East Coast as well. Yeah, fantastic. Look, and uh, we are a short form podcast. And I just want to, before we, we sort of round off, I just want to thank you again for coming on and having a chat, because I think this is um, such an interesting area, such an important area. Um, I particularly enjoy the fact that there are people like you um, and other members of the uh, of the industry that are really keen to come out and talk about it and, um, and, and, and um, share this information, because I think it is important to get your story out there and, and, and the industry as a whole, because it is vital. Um, but um, so thank you again. Um, um, so to finish off, um, tell us what you're excited about at the moment. Yeah, well, look, you know, firstly, thanks for the opportunity to come on. You know, we're really working hard to get some some clear and concise messages into the community about waste to energy. Because as I say, we've got something positive to say, uh, and there's been enough uh, uh, fuzzy science and negativity around waste to energy. It's time to, mm. to set the record straight. So what I'm really excited about is the next phase, uh, which is uh, moving into an operating plant um, because, you know, that, that uh, takes uh, the messaging to, to the next level um, when stakeholders, community, local government, uh, regulators can come and have a look at the plant in full operation, um, see the emissions performance, um, see the positiveness that, uh, uh, that is around uh, these projects. Um, and certainly, you know, for, for John Lang as a, you know, responsible investor in, in infrastructure, you know, we're really excited by the opportunities on the East Coast as well. You know, we want to work with partners on the East Coast um, and uh, uh, for them to benefit from our experience and, and what it took to t- uh, put these projects together. Um, mm-hmm. We think we've, we've got something to say there and would be a great partner uh, on the East Coast. So that really excites me as well. 
Oh, fantastic. So um, no new 10-year plan, flying cars or anything like that to commit to next time? No, uh, I think there's still plenty of uh, value enhancements to have uh, with the project here. You know, interestingly, you know, we're looking at things like hydrogen. We're looking at things yes. like you know, electric vehicles. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, let's let's get the plant built and, uh, yeah, then we'll uh, start looking at these uh, value enhancements from there. Yeah, no, you, you're quite right. I think um, you're the second person that's mentioned um, um, electric vehicles and hydrogen to me today as well. So it's... Um, 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 it's going to be a, a snowball, isn't it, of um, of these technologies and, and these advancements and the and the acceptability um, to people or the the, as you, the community um, and um, and the welcoming of the community into these new new technologies, new ideas, and new things. And it's um, it, hopefully it's going to be really quickly. Um, hmm. So fantastic, um, Jason. Once again, thank you ever so much. It's been um, great to have you on the podcast, and um, um, hopefully we can talk to you again when things are a bit further down the line. And um, thank you very much. And um, and have a great day. Thanks, Patrick. Really enjoyed it. Integrated Infrastructure is powered by North Search, specialists in executive and technical search across engineering, design, construction, property, and energy markets in Australia. If you'd like to find out more about North Search or get involved with this podcast, you can click on the links in the show notes or email me directly at the address on the screen. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Integrated Infrastructure. Please tell your friends and colleagues if you did, and we hope to see you again soon.